was a young kid, and you never saw a man out without wearing a hat. They were, no matter where they went, they wore a hat. My grandfather, on my father's side, uh, was a hatter, and he owned a hat factory uh, in Dan Murray. I believe he started in what they called the finishing shop in uh, one of the hat shops in Bethel, Connecticut. And from there, he eventually became uh, the owner of a hat, a hat company in Bethel called the Faye Gorman Hat Company. And he ran that for a number of years. Eventually, he, he became partners with a man named Murphy, and they formed a bigger company called the, the Murphy Gorman Hat Company in Danbury. My grandfather passed away in 1929, of course. That was the year of the stock market crash, the beginning of the, the Great Recession, or Depression, I should say. And uh, the stock market crash had a big influence on their company, and eventually their company was dissolved. Uh, but my, my dad, when he was uh, just out of college, he worked for the hat company as a salesman, going to New York, Boston. So once the hat, they were out of the hat business, uh, that was the end of our connection with the hatting industry. Xander Benedict was an early hatter. Um, when a history was first compiled in 1850s, or an account of Hatting and Danbury. He was named as the first Hatter, but there's a good possibility that his father or relatives were involved in it before that. After the revolution, Zedek Benedict was probably the first to start maybe producing hats for more than just the local people, you know, trying to think of a way to make a business out of it. He wasn't the first to actually set up the first hat factory, though. That was a couple of other people in the 1790s. Originally, all these, a lot of these hatters were actually nomadic. They would move from place to place. They would make a lot of money in one place, and then, you know, if there was no work for a while, they'd try to go somewhere else, or they'd take the time off. So they were kind of a privileged trade, or a craft-based trade. Their skill was the linchpin of the whole industry. Until they really mechanized everything, you couldn't make a hat without a skilled labor. In the clothing industry, basically, the, you know, if you were in a clothing factory, you got the clothing, the cloth from somewhere, you gave it to the guys who, the people who worked on it, and they put it together. Here, they had to make the raw material. The process of making hats had to do with fur being taken from animal skins, rabbits, beavers. And what they did was, to, to get the fur off of the pelts of the animals, they had to boil these skins and shrink them, and it would remove the fur. The, the, the process, uh, they used uh, a very dangerous chemical. They didn't know it was dangerous at the time, but uh, they used something called mercury nitrate. The solution of nitrate of mercury, which made the fibers bind together. Each individual fiber of fur has little kind of burrs on it and it would help these to attach to one another and then create the felt. When they boiled it up it gave off mercury vapor and that was poisonous but no one knew it at the time. It wasn't like they were drinking this stuff. It was they were exposed to it a lot and a lot of it got into the water. There's a lot of steam in these factories because they they were shrinking the felt into into hats. So there was like a massive, massive amounts of steam. So the mercury was, you know, getting in, into the, the steam, getting into the water that might be on the floor. So there were constantly, constant exposure to it. From 1941 on, they stopped using mercury nitrate as an agent to remove those. But those, those workers from that earlier time, they were subject to getting what they called the shakes, the header shakes. In fact, they sometimes were called the Danbury Shakes because the mercury poison got into their, into their systems and uh, created a lot of problems, mental problems. Sometimes they, uh, they would become agitated very, very easily because of this effect on their bodies. And that's where the term mad had her. You know, the, nobody knew at the time what was making them mad. Though in fact, some of the owners, in order to protect the process, used to say that 
oh, you know, the workers, uh, the reason they're getting that way is because they abuse alcohol and tobacco. That was their excuse. But the doctors proved that, you know, that it was re a real thing, the Mad Hatters. Uh, it was really a disease. Wear a hat, keep your neighbor working was a slogan that was on the, new, the Danbury, in those days it was called Danbury News Times, and that was right, up, right on the front page of the paper uh, near the name News Times. Wear a hat, keep your neighbor working. And that was true because not only was the hatting, the manufacturer of hats, a big employer for Danburyans at the time, but there were other factories in Danbury that made hat machinery for the making of hats. You know, that's where the hat city came from. Most everybody was connected with the manufacture of hats. There's no way you can get away from hats when you're dealing with Danbury's history. It's a very hands-on craft, so you learn a lot by feel. So the more experience you had, the better off you were, especially in the early days. And there'd be a gigantic kettle inside it and a bench and maybe a couple of workmen, and they would, you know, they would create the felt out of fur and whatever else, you know, usually different kinds of animals. Then they would shape it into a cone, a big cone of felt. And then they would have to do all these processes with shrinking it and making it into sizes with molds and things and polishing it off with pumice and stuff like that to, to really finish it off. Giving it a nice smooth finish, that would be, that was a, a, a really high skill. So those guys were usually better, better paid. The guys that worked on the making the cones into something that looked sort of like a hat, those guys got less pay, but they had access to machines earlier. The other group was trimmers. So anything that involved sewing was farmed out to women. And at first it was just sent to farmhouses and like people would sew things, sew the ribbons on and put the feathers on, sew in the hat band. So all the sewing work was done by women, and then when the factories came about, it was still women, but there would be like huge rooms where women were working like sewing circle. Over time, what manufacturers did to make things more efficient was get a machine that could do each piece. And some parts of making a hat were easier to develop a machine for than others. The, the finishers, the people in the shops who sized the hats, those were called the makers, and then there's the trimmers. And then there's one or two other all unions, but those were the main ones. They were all unionized. The hat finishers were one of the first unionized trades in the country, but they usually were kind of accommodating to one another um, until about the 1880s. There was people who got into the, into the manufacturing that didn't feel like unions should be there, <laughs> and they did everything they could to break them. But um, usually the unions would try to protect the journeyman's jobs, and so they would limit the number of people they would allow him to, to be hired in the shops. And sometimes they would like have to alter that when it was just more work than people were able to handle. So they, they worked it out usually, but not always. Um, eventually there was a big uh, lockout where some of the manufacturers really tried to break the unions. As a result of that, the Hatters all joined a thing called the United Hatters, which was a national organization and then they in turn joined the American Federation of Labor. So the American Federation of Labor was a big blanket umbrella labor organization whose chief weapon was boycotting. If some manufacturer didn't go along with what they demanded, they would issue a boycott and people all over the country would stop buying their hat. The Hatter strike that took place in the early 1900s that was a big, made a big change for the labor movement in this country. And it was called the, uh, the, the Hatters, the Danbury Hatters Strike. I think it was around 1902 or 08, somewhere in that area. What I remember about that, I think the name of the lawsuit was Lowe versus Lawler. Lowe was owned the hat, hat company and, at that time. And Lawler represented the union workers. Lowe was a a small manufacturer. He was not, you know, not a big time guy, but he's very fair to his workmen. The people who worked for him actually liked him a lot. 
Um, but he, when he was asked to join, uh, to unionize his shop, reunionize his shop actually, he was balking at it because he thought things were fine. But the National Union of United Hatters, backed by the AFL, see, AFL wanted, to, um, wanted to unionize the whole industry. So in a, he became one of the people standing in their way. Okay, that's not a big deal, except that he was backed by uh, some people who were ideologically opposed to unions. So their idea was to bring everything to court, and what their contention was was that the antitrust laws that were on the books, the first one was called the Sherman Antitrust Law, which prevented monopolies, basically. They got unions around the country to also boycott the products of this ad company or low. So he won that lawsuit. They turned that around and said, well, a union is, if the union's trying to stop trade, then that's a monopoly too. Which meant that the union or the workers at the hat factory, they had to pay the owner about $250,000, quarter of a million dollars. Back in those days, that was a lot of money because of money he lost because of the strike. What the anti-boycott people did was um, tie up the property of random hatters. They picked like 200 people, out of that, almost out of a hat. Some of them were, they were union people, but some of them had nothing to do with anything. And uh, they couldn't sell, buy or sell their property for all that time. And to help pay that off, the, the National Union had a hat day where every hat, hat worker donated an hour's pay to help pay off this, this uh, lawsuit. The National Union paid off um, the claims because they kept losing in court. Um, Congress passed legislation to remedy that anti-union thing. It was in the first antitrust legislation. And supposedly this had a big effect on the 1916 presidential election that elected uh, Woodrow Wilson. Because um, the guy who he was running against had been a, one of the Supreme Court justices who ruled against the Hatters. So he was able to say, you know, hey, this guy's not for the working man. <laughs> Look what he did. But that, that was... Uh... That was a big thing in labor law because it went against the union and it went in favor of the owner. Uh, but I do remember my father saying that they, they didn't like the union because, of course, owners were on the other opposite side from the workers and no negotiating anything. But the one thing about the hatting industry, from what I was told from my father, was that they were amongst the highest paid workers in the country because they worked on, they were what they call peace workers, P-I-E-C-E. -E. They got paid by the peace rather than by the hour. So the faster they worked, the more product they put out, the more money they made. So that was an unusual thing in the labor movement to have peace work. As growing up as a, as a child, uh, in the 1940s and 50s, almost everyone who lived in my neighborhood lived, worked uh, in some capacity in the hatting industry. And uh, one of the major hat factories in Danbury was the Lee, the Frank, Frank H. Lee Hat Factory. It was only a couple blocks from my house. My grandmother lived down the street from our house, and she lived uh, on the corner of South Street and Wixted Avenue in Danbury. And from there, from her yard, we could look over uh, a couple of houses and we could see the chimneys, the tall chimneys uh, of the hat factory, the Lee Hat Factory on Lee Mac Avenue in Danbury. It was Lee and another big hatter in school, it was McLaughlin. There were two McLaughlin brothers, but he was in partnership with one of them. So they named the road Lemack Avenue. That was the biggest hat factory in the country in the early 1900s. Uh, there was also the George McLaughlin Hat Factory. In fact, I played on their Little League team. They sponsored a Little League team. In fact, they shortened the name to Macklin's on our jerseys, I remember. So they were two of the big ones that I remember. There were a number of small hat companies, too, at that time. But the three big ones were Lee's. McLaughlin's and uh, 
the Mallory or Stetson company. Tweedy was another big name for a long time, for several generations. Um, John W. Green was one that was around for a long time. He introduced the Derby. The Mallory Hat Factory, which was up on Rose Street, they made Stetson. That was their brand, the Stetson Hats. In fact, they were in business, I think, until 1965. I think they were the last hat factory to close in Danbury in 1965. I got to see uh, the interior of the last hat factory before it, before it uh, closed. It had been the Mallory factory, which was one of the big ones, but I got to see them, you know, doing the whole process. It was pretty cool. Well, hats were, men's hats were fashion item, right? And for a long time, they were necessities. So everybody, every man bought a couple of hats a year. In the 1920s, 1930s, there was a big fashion change for men, and they stopped wearing hats, generally, because automobiles had changed. Their designs had changed. Early cars were open, kind of open cars. But once, uh, after World War II, when uh, the, the auto industry geared up again, and sedans and uh, coupes, those type of cars came into, into uh, popularity, it became difficult for a man to wear a hat while he was sitting in the car. Getting in and out of the car, you have to take the hat off. Those cars of the 40s that I remember, they had kind of smaller windows uh, on, the, on the doors, and you would see that people, when they had to get in and out, you know, hats would be very uncomfortable to wear. So that was one theory that maybe that became less popular for men. And the other theory that I've heard talked about was John F. Kennedy was the first president not to wear a hat. And from that point on, the popularity of wearing hats for men declined. Whenever the economy was bad, whenever people weren't buying hats because there's a depression or a war on or something, they suffered. Because they weren't, unless they got uniform contracts, they weren't making a lot of hats. Instead of buying one every year, a couple every year, they would just buy one and be good for life. That was like the panic button right there. So that finally got to Frank Lee and a few of the other manufacturers and they decided we've got, we've got to do something to diversify our industry because we're just getting, um, we're getting killed right at the time of World War I. <clears throat> so they created a thing called the Danbury Industrial Corporation. It's not around anymore. But it was responsible for a lot of the factories around Danbury that are there today. After World War II, a lot of industries wanted to get more land, build factories that, you know, could be spread out more. This was, this was heaven up here. So there's a bunch of like electronics companies, um, metal fabrication, ball bearings, all kinds of stuff. The jobs that were once all hatting jobs, because you had a trained population, uh, and it was a blue collar town, and these people were able, they were very employable. They had good work skills. You know, there's a transition that could be made there. And then the machine shops had made parts for the hatting machines. Those easily transitioned into ball bearings. So they were able, they went into all different kinds of industries instead of sticking with one. And consequently, uh, through the 50s, 60s, 70s and beyond, into this century, Danbury has become and has always maintained a very strong economy, one of the strongest in Connecticut. To see how your, your, your town or city has evolved to what it is today and, this, and to see the different, uh, you know, the, the different ways that people have earned a living in, in the community over the years, I, I, I feel I was very lucky to grow up in Danbury, very proud of being a Danbury because my family has deep roots here, going back to the hatting industry, and now I see my own family growing up here. You know, it, it makes me feel proud.